Hello, uh, welcome everybody. Um, you are in the right place if you are here to see Sam Keen and Mary Roach. Uh, today we are talking about Sam Keen's new book, The Ice Pick Surgeon. Murder, fraud, sabotage, piracy, and other dastardly deeds perpetrated in the name of science. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Very excited. Uh, my name is Devin. I'm from Green Apple on Clement Street. And uh, I'm just going to start with a couple of announcements about upcoming events and uh, that kind of thing. And then I'm going to uh, hand it off to the author. So uh, stuff coming up you might be interested in. This Thursday, we have Christian Radke and R.O. Kwan discussing Radke's new book, CQ, A Journey Through American Loneliness. There is a silent epidemic in America, loneliness. Shameful to talk about and often misunderstood, loneliness is everywhere, from the most major of metropolises to the smallest of towns. In CQ, Kristen Radke's wide-ranging exploration of our inner lives and public selves, Radke digs into the ways in which we attempt to feel closer to one another in the distance that remains. Ranging from the invention of the laugh track to the rise of Instagram, the bootstrap pulling cowboy to the brutal experiments of Harry Harlow, Radke investigates why we engage with each other and what we risk when we turn away. Coming up a little bit later on August 4th, we have Jamie Lowe and Kim Kelly discussing Lowe's new book, Breathing Fire, Female Inmate Firefighters on the Front Lines of California's Wildfires. Uh, this is one that I'm particularly interested to hear uh, people talking about. California's fire season gets hotter, longer, and more extreme every year. It's now year round. Of the thousands of firefighters who battle California's blazes every year, roughly 30% of the on the ground wildland crews are inmates earning a dollar an hour. Approximately 200 of those firefighters are women serving on all female crews. In Breathing Fire, Jamie Lowe expands on her revelatory work for the New York Times Magazine. She spent years getting to know dozens of women who have participated in the fire camp program and spoken to captains, family and friends, correctional officers, and camp commanders. The result is a rare illuminating look at how the fire camps actually operate, a story that encompasses California's underlying catastrophes of climate change, economic disparity, and historical injustice but also draws on deeply personal histories, relationships, desires, frustrations, and the emotional and physical intensity of firefighting. So on to tonight's main event. Uh, so for those of you out there in the audience, um, the chat is enabled, but of course we request that you remain civil, like the civil people we know you are. Um, we also have a Q&A box, um, which if you're on a desktop, you'll see is kind of down in the bottom with the speech bubbles. If you're on a mobile device, it's probably in the dot, dot, dot menu. Uh, feel free to drop questions into that uh, toward the end of the session. We will do some question and answers and uh, hopefully we'll have lots of good things to talk about. So without further ado, tonight uh, we have Sam Keen and Mary Roach. Uh, Introducing Mary first, she's the best-selling author of a half dozen books on topics such as cadavers, the alimentary canal, and the human experience of space travel. Her new book, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law, is coming out on September 14th. And last but not least, Sam Keen, whose new book, The Ice Pick Surgeon, is what we are here for. His other best-selling books include The Disappearing Spoon, The Violinist's Thumb, and The Bastard Brigade. And with that, I am going to um, say so long and farewell and I'll leave it to the two of you. Okay. All right. Well, hello everyone. Thank you all for joining me tonight. I very much appreciate it. I'm going to start off reading a short excerpt from the book and then we will jump back to a conversation uh, between Mary and me. So I'm gonna start with the excerpt here. Let me switch over. And just as sort of a lead into this, this comes in a chapter where I'm talking about grave robbing and anatomy riots. Uh, basically, there were a lot of doctors back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, 
who wanted bodies to study anatomy, but very few people at the time were willing to donate their bodies to medical schools for doctors to use them. And there were many people who were very upset about the fact that doctors would go and essentially hire people to rob the graves. So this leads in from that at the point when most American states have passed what they called anatomy acts or bone bills. And these laws gave medical schools the right to unclaimed bodies from hospitals and poorhouses. But the bills kicked up the same ethical issues in America as they did across the Atlantic in Great Britain. Uh, what's more, it soon became clear that using unclaimed bodies was not only ethically dicey because the burden fell mostly on poor people, but this was also scientifically dubious as well. Because as crazy as it sounds, your income can affect your anatomy. So these differences in anatomy due to income trace back to hormones. And there's of course a lot of individual differences among people, but in a broad general sense, poor people suffer from chronic stress at higher rates than those in the middle and upper income classes. The reasons are pretty obvious. Poverty stricken populations generally have more medical problems and fewer means to treat them. They're more exposed to pollutants and especially back in the 1800s, many of them faced eviction and starvation on a regular basis. The body responds to such stressors by releasing adrenaline and other hormones and chronic stress can affect the size and shape of the glands that pump those hormones out. Some glands like heavily worked muscles end up swelling in size. Other glands exhaust themselves and shrivel down. And because the poor alone were undergoing dissection then, the doctors learning anatomy on them had sort of a skewed view of what those glands should look like. So there was systematic error in their science. And this was not just an academic worry either. It had real deadly consequences. In the 1800s, scores of babies started dying from what we now call SIDS, sudden in death syndrome. Naturally, doctors wanted to know the cause of this. So they started performing autopsies on these SIDS babies. And they noticed that most SIDS babies had one gland in particular that looked enormous, the thymus glands inside their chests. In reality, these were actually normal sized thymus glands. They only seemed large compared to the wilted thymus glands that doctors usually found in babies from poor families. These poor babies had often died of chronic and stressful ailments like diarrhea or malnutrition. SIDS babies, in contrast, died suddenly by definition before diarrhea or malnutrition could wither their glands down. As a result, their thymus glands were normal sized. But pathologists were not aware of this and they began blaming SIDS on a hypertrophied thymus glands inside the chest. They decided these big glands were crushing babies' windpipes and suffocating them. So to shrink the glands back down, doctors in the early 1900s began blasting babies' thymus glands with radiation. Thousands upon thousands of children suffered burns, depleted glands, and later cancer as a result, leading to an estimated 10,000 premature deaths. It's a poignant example of how an unethical scientific setup can lead to dangerous scientific outcomes. And eventually, the voluntary donation of bodies eliminated the need to use unclaimed corpses from hospitals, poorhouses, and things like that. In fact, philosopher Jeremy Bentham, the founder of utilitarianism, became the first person in history to donate his body to science in 1832, in part to lessen the stigma of dissection. And today, the majority of cadavers dissected in medical schools are gifts. But still, medical schools today often struggle to find enough cadavers. In some cases, they're up to 40% short of what they need. And it's not just bodies anymore either. Like car thieves chopping up automobiles for parts, grave robbers can make more money, up to $200,000, by hacking bodies up and selling individual tissues. 
teeth, eardrums, corneas, tendons, even bladders and skin. Often the families of the deceased have no idea this is happening. Some have fetched their loved ones from funeral homes to find the bones replaced with PVC piping. And at least these families got the bodies back whole. In 2004, a funeral director from Staten Island got caught selling bones to the US Army for $30,000. Excuse me, selling bodies to the US Army for $30,000. The Army was dressing the bodies in armored footwear and dangling them over landmines to test how well this footwear worked. Now, to be sure, the international laws governing transplant organs like lungs, livers, kidneys, those are fairly ro robust and prevent trafficking. But otherwise, as one anatomy professor lamented, we are more careful with importing fruits and vegetables than we are with body parts. And while the poor are once again more at risk for being chopped up, it also happened to longtime Masterpiece Theater host Alistair Cook in 2004 as well. So that's just a little bit about uh, this sort of old strange story about anatomy, but also kind of how it throws light on things that are happening nowadays. And that is something I tried to do in the book. There's a lot of old stories in there, but there's a lot of long shadows cast by these stories that still affect how science and medicine get done today. So that was one of kind of the goals with me writing the book. And with that short excerpt, I think we will move over to Q&A. So Mary, welcome. Sure. sure. Well, the first thing I have to ask you, Sam, is how did you manage to read while appearing to look directly into the camera? Do you have some kind of a- <laughs> Optical, like uh, it, it's projecting it or something? No, I, did, I had a little PDF here and I guess I just, good, good eye kind, I don't know what it was. Okay, it's very slick, it's very smooth anyway. Um, um, yeah, anatomy, uh, that is uh, um, my stomping ground as well. And that's a particularly, I mean, a, a lot of the stories in the ice pick surgeon, I mean, most of them uh, have to do with live people. Um, and and it, when, the, when the victim is a, a dead person, it's, a, it's such an interesting, ethically challenging area because the goal is good, you know, to learn, particularly when there was no alternative. Um, right. you know, I remember, you know, William Harvey cut open his, in, in figuring out human circulation, experimented on his own mother, I mean, dead, right. <laughs> right. but because there was, there's no alternative, there's no, um, you know, you can look at animals, but that only takes you so far. Yeah. Um, and it, and uh, it was really a, a you know, how do you, and when you're dealing with religion, you know, people's beliefs that, you know, you're going to, somebody needs their intact body in the afterlife. It's such a tough, um, it's such a tough call, and I, I think, and I love that you included um, John Hunter because he was kind of a sort of like a almost a Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, he's he's sort of yeah. the of surgery, but he's got the guy, the body's coming in the back door. Uh, I loved that. Yeah, in fact, Robert Louis Stevenson based Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde in part on John Hunter because he did have like this this complete different uh, dual personality going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and 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 some of the characters in the book, um, it was it was almost as though uh, you know they they went off down these very dark roads, and I'm thinking of like John Cutler, um, mm -hmm. and then and then later, but later on, you know, in, in if you look at their whole career, they went on to do some really wonderful work, almost as though you know atoning for their for their past deeds. But um, John Cutler was the one that I just was gobsmacked by. The, the things that he, I wondered if you could talk about him a little, just the, the gonorrhea work and how far he went and, and, and yeah, anyway. That. Yeah, that is kind of a common theme of different scientists and especially some of the, the more medical scientists in the book was that a lot of them did start off with very good intentions. They were really trying to help people. And if they had, you know, either had someone just stopped them at the beginning a little bit or just thought it through a little bit more. They could have gone down in history as doing a lot of great work, but they just were either too ambitious or just were kind of blind to the suffering. It's really, it's really frustrating and hard to read about sometimes when you get to these people. Um, but John Cutler, you were mentioning, was a doctor who was working on, uh, I think I called it the surprisingly pressing issue of venereal disease in the military. And there was some sort of estimate in there where the US military estimated they were going to lose during World War II 
something like 7 million people days of work just to venereal disease. That would be like keeping 10 full aircraft carriers of people home unable to fight or support because of venereal disease. So this was a very big issue. They assigned John Cutler to try to stop it. Uh, he had some ideas about some pills that he was going to try out, some platements that you essentially smear on the sexual organs to prevent transmission, things like that. Uh, it didn't work out during World War II, but afterward, he got invited down to Guatemala to try to, uh, do, to do more experiments down there. And essentially, he got invited by one of the people running the Guatemalan health ministry who had access to prisoners, soldiers, and to prostitutes. And prostitution was legal in Guatemala, even for prisoners. So their plan was they were going to scout the health clinics for prostitutes who came down with gonorrhea or syphilis. And then they were going to channel them basically to prisoners and um, soldiers to see how well these ointments worked in preventing the transmission of these diseases. Um, and the really horrifying thing, I mean, this is bad enough already, but the really horrifying thing was that Cutler did not tell anyone that he was exposing them to these diseases. So these soldiers and the um, prisoners had no idea they were being exposed. Uh, John Cutler also did a lot of creepy things. Uh, he would feed them drinks beforehand. He had his wife come in and take close up pictures of their genitals afterward. And then eventually he ended up going to a psychiatric hospital. And that's where kind of the really horrific work started yeah. because he was injecting it into people who could not consent to be a part of the program, had no idea what was going on, injecting it into different body parts, their eyes at some point. And that's really where he kind of went off the rails. Um, and it's just hard to imagine what he was thinking, why he would think that that would be okay. Yeah. But then you kind of talk about afterward, he ended up going on and doing a lot of good work in other areas. He went to India and he helped spread um, a lot of work about helping women so that they could have access to birth control, so that they could have, they could give a baby or have a baby without dying in labor, things like that. So it's really kind of, again, this Jekyll and Hyde experience with Cutler. Yeah, yeah. and there were, there were some interesting cases um, where it, 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 it's a, it may be a story a lot of people have heard, but they haven't heard the whole story. Um, and the nuance and the kind of gradual unfolding is fascinating. The Tuskegee experiment was, it, it, interestingly, in the beginning, before penicillin had been discovered as a cure, and there really wasn't a good cure. There was mercury, which was, you know, almost as bad. Or as, arsenic, yeah. Uh, arsenic, sorry, arsenic, yeah. Or both, I mean, both of them, either one. Both, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so in the beginning, it was kind of a little easier to justify, you know, well, there isn't a cure. Uh, so, I mean, not, not that I'm not condoning it, but then, you know, fast forward to now we have penicillin and the dude keeps doing it and he withholds the penicillin. But you could just imagine, you know, I've put all these years and time into my, you know, you kind of yeah how it unfolds. And I guess... You, you know, kind of convince yourself, but that was so interesting to, you know, to, in, I think, which is where storytelling, uh, science and storytelling is so important to, you know, to, to, to see the, the character and the, and the kind of plot line is fascinating. There also the, the case of, um, is it Smithman, the, the, um, the, Smithman, the yeah, Henry um, yeah. and his feelings, his exposure to slavery, his need to, to, you know, get to these remote places and traveling on these ships initially, horrified by what he was seeing on slave ships and then gradually i mean that moral evolution was so interesting um, yeah the deterioration he went through yeah and that's kind of another common theme is that i i really want to talk about sort of the psychology of what was going on in their heads and kind of how they justified it to themselves you just see some common themes coming up where they have extreme tunnel vision. They don't look around at yeah. other the possible things going on. They um, they start to use euphemisms. They start to make slow compromises <laughs> gradually. And um, yeah, Smithman, you were mentioning, is a good example. He was a naturalist from England in the late 1700s who started off as an abolitionist. 
And he decided he wanted to make his name as a naturalist. He wanted to go abroad. He wanted to look at different species from Africa, South America, things like that. Well, it turned out that unless you were independently wealthy, one of the only ways to get to those places was to travel on slave ships because those were the pla those were the, uh, the people sailing to those places. So we ended up, you just see him make compromise after compromise going from someone who was originally a foe of slavery to someone who ends up actually dabbling in slaves, trading slaves in order to make a little bit of money to help out his science. So right. that moral deterioration, you just kind of see that over and over yeah, again. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you also mentioned, and, and this is, I find one of the most useful concepts in psychology, cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is you know you have these two competing notions you know in his case um i'm a good person and, yes. and here's these you know slave owners you know and, and those are those are bad people but, you know so that those that doesn't jive so something has to change so you, you have mm -hmm. to like well maybe they're not that bad i'm a yeah. good and i wouldn't hang around with them so maybe they're not that bad and I mean, I, I was a yeah. slave major in, in yeah. college. Or, or else he would he would yeah. befriend the slave ship captains and then dismiss the people like the, the regular old sailors on the ship. And those are the bad people, but the yeah. captains are actually okay. So yeah, you see him, those little justifications in his head, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the other example uh, that I um, wanted to mention is just a, of a, a story that people I think of that are familiar. Well, it's, it's actually the cover, the ice pick surgeon, which is yeah. a story of lobotomy, um, and it and it's you know I, I'd heard about it kind of as just one person started doing this, and but it's it, it's I mean you have the Moniz is the first guy, right? Mm -hmm. I guess Moniz. I'm pronouncing that right, Moniz. So yeah, you have someone who's and in the beginning, you know the conditions are so horrible in these these asylums um, that he was actually helping somewhat. Um, and there wasn't a good alternative. Again, there wasn't wasn't until antipsychotic anti medications where there was a, another alternative. But but then you know then you have Freeman and Freeman. What a piece of work! <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, for you tell yeah. me, talk about Freeman. He he's just such a, a, a just such a, a fascinating character in like this uh, macabre kind of way. Um, but yeah, as, as you said, as as strange as it sounds, at the very beginning, lobotomies were kind of defensible in some ways because they had no psychiatric drugs. They had no way to treat these people. And people were basically just tossed into asylums and left there to rot. There was nothing they could do for them. So lobotomies, when they were practiced by uh, official licensed neurosurgeons, and they were limited in area and limited only to the worst cases as a last resort, did end up calming people down. They could go outside afterward and just walk around. They could have a meal with other people, just do these kind of human everyday things. So yeah. at the last resort, they were okay. But then someone like Freeman comes along who has a bit of a messiah complex, I think, where he decides he is going to be the one to basically empty out asylums across the country by uh, industrializing lobotomies, essentially. His daughter at one point called him the Henry Ford of lobotomies. And he loved being called that because that's exactly his ambition. He wanted to be someone out there mass producing them. He would go to asylums and do up to 24 of them a day. He would do sometimes two with one hand or uh, two with his <laughs> hand at the same time, basically showing off, getting reporters to take pictures. He, he was, like you said, he was just a piece of work. But there was kind of this nugget there where at the beginning you can say, okay, well, he had good intentions, but yeah. you know, we all know what uh, the road to hell was paved with. And he yeah, is- and a I, I, I think of the point at which he started doing preventive lobotomies. Yes, or he would, he would go and he would do them on teenagers so that they didn't yeah. end up in asylums. He did it on yes. Rosemary Kennedy, uh, JFK's sister, so. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the book is in some ways kind of the history of, um, just not elitism, but this sort of sense of the scientist feeling anointed to do, you know, I'm, I am science. I can just- yeah, there, there, There's definitely an attitude like that that runs throughout a lot of these cases where, yeah. you know, they, when I, we, we want to think of science as a force for good, it's, it's, it's a, a good thing in the world. Yeah. And most of the time it is, but 
I think that's what fascinated me so much about these cases was these weren't scientists just going out and, you know, committing everyday petty crimes. They were doing it in the pursuit of knowledge. And normally that's a good thing, but just the idea that it's going to get twisted in this dark way was really kind of fascinating, I thought. Yeah, yeah. People people use the term mad scientist, but these are these like and you think, oh, crazy, you know, ranting lunatic. Um, mm -hmm. but these were the opposite. They were quite sane. They were, as you point out, they were too sane. They were too rational. They did they yes. lost yeah. their humanity in pursuit of their ego gratification or fame or riches or whatever, but also this sen the, the sense of si it's science. It's important. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was, it was so interesting. And, the, and we think about it, you know, today, m m like the focus is more on animal subjects, but, but, you know, looking back, it, you know, it was, it was humans, it was poor people, it was, you know, prostitutes, like you said, it was slaves, it was mm -hmm. healthy humans uh, yeah. who, who were. Who, who bore the brunt in a lot of cases for um, advances in medical science uh, against their will in most cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, yeah, uh, it's it's interesting looking at you know things taken out of the context of their time. I mean, I wonder how you feel about you know. I, I remember reading the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks and and it and thinking about the the Johns Hopkins people who had done the work on the tumor on the cell mm -hmm. and and in that day at that time it was just well this is biomedical waste. Obviously, I don't care who it came from, you know. And then right. suddenly, you know the story comes out and. Um, and then you know you go back decades back from there and and you wonder did these people think i guess you know in the context of the day that's sort of like well i'm a i'm a white scientist i'm i right. okay yeah this stuff. I, that's something yeah. i wrestled with a lot in the book is it's uh it's a little hard sometimes to apply contemporary moral standards to cases in the past but i think you can look at some cases where even people at the time were criticizing them for what they were doing. For instance, you mentioned John Hunter, the famous anatomist. Yeah. There's a case in the book where there was a giant, very famous giant named Charles Byrne, yeah. who would exhibit himself. He was seven feet seven tall or whatever he was. He would wear a giant hat on top of that. Um, and Hunter saw him. And the first thing Hunter thought, his first thought was, I need that skeleton. That's all he cared about was getting that skeleton. He went to approach him, sort of tried to be ethical. And Byrne was horrified. Byrne said, absolutely not. And I don't want to spoil it, but there's this gigantic caper essentially in the book with lots of switcheroos and all this stuff where he ends up getting his hands on Burns's body and displaying it in a museum. And it is still in this museum today. But even at the time, people recognized that he had crossed a line, that he had done something bad. One of his good friends called it like Hunter's Museum of Human Misery or something like that, where he recognized that he was really crossing the line. Yeah. So I do think it is fair to go back and look at what their contemporaries were saying yeah. and say, you know, people were criticizing, they were bringing these points up to him and he just ignored them. So I think it, that is a, uh, a bit yeah. of a hard thing to navigate, but I think you can in some cases look at yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I almost, I got the sense reading the, the book that, Probably you could grab any successful scientist back then, and there'd be some deed that was a little sketchy in terms of what we. Oh, yeah. even, even like um, was Isaac Newton, right? Wasn't he also? Uh, I, I know, talked about that, yeah, in the in the context of the the chapter on slavery, where yeah. I talked about naturalists were most of the ones who were wrapped up in it. But um, you know, even Isaac Newton was getting data when he was he, so when he was putting together Principia, one of the big pieces of evidence that the moon, the gravitational uh, tug of the moon was causing tides on the earth was how tides would rise and fall at different points around the world. So he would write to people who were at slave ports around the world and they would give him data on the tides. And these people would not have been there had they not been uh, trading slaves. So that even someone like Isaac Newton working in celestial mechanics, this sort of rarefied, kind of literally otherworldly 
area, even he and his work was tied up with some ways on the slave trade. And that really kind of hits at home about how pretty much all the economy, science, everything in some way was kind of tied into the slave trade. That's one thing I really tried to bring out in that chapter. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, the, um, yeah, there were, there were just a few instances of, of individuals who just, it didn't, it didn't seem like sort of a slow unraveling or like the pressures of doing science in that day and age. It just seemed like they're pure evil. Like, they, were just, they were just bad people. Yes. Like Murray, um, Dr. Murray was one that was an interesting um, kind of jumped in with both feet instead of breaking bad. Yeah. Yeah. Just from the get go. Um, yeah. Murray. And there was, oh, and Murray and money. Yeah. John money. Like he just seemed a little tweaked, but Murray, yeah. Murray and I, Murray was fascinating uh, because of the Ted Kaczynski um, connection. I mean, it, it, you know, people thought, oh, Kaczynski, uh, he went to UC Berkeley. That's where he got so that right, right. wrong. But you brought out another uh, uh, element of his life that I don't think any, I mean, I certainly had never heard that. Did you want to, that was fascinating. Yeah, so Henry Murray was a psychologist at uh, Harvard in the 1950s. He had ties to the CIA. It's not quite, quite clear whether he was doing this work on behalf of the CIA or he was just kind of mixed up in, with those people in that time, whatever. But he ran an experiment on what he called uh, gifted undergraduate men at Harvard, young men, uh, picked 22 of them out. And Ted Kaczynski, the future Unabomber, was one of those people. And basically the point of the experiment was to verbally abuse them until the point where they broke down and he could shatter them. It was basically kind of what they do to soldiers at boot camp, except they didn't want to raise them back up and try to put them, like give them anything to hold on to. He just wanted to break them down, break them down, break them down. And he was doing this in the context of the Cold War in that oh, there was all this faulty intelligence I talked about in the book where we essentially thought that the Soviets had figured out how to hack the mind and the Soviets knew how to brainwash people. Turned out it was complete baloney, but people like Murray thought, well, we want to be able to do that to the Soviets. So why don't I practice on these undergraduates to do that? Warped logic, but that's what he decided to do. Some of them, you know, they, they almost uniformly said it was a bad experience. None of them liked it, but Kaczynski showed up at Harvard when he was only 16 years old. He probably had some issues anyway, based on his upbringing, based on his own kind of emotional makeup. And he later described that as the single worst experience of his life. He absolutely hated it. It, was, it lasted for multiple years, just abuse, 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 week after week after week. Now, as you said, a lot of people assume that assume that he went out to Berkeley, got radicalized out there, but all his, his plans about revenge and getting back at society actually crystallized for him at Harvard. That is what really made him the angry person. And it wasn't until he got to Berkeley and had saved up some money, essentially, that he eventually took off and uh, instigated the bombing lane that he did. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you. In the, in the end of the book, you talk about the future and um, some paths that we might go down that might um, end up with some dastardliness and, and, and that we need to be careful. And um, the future of dastardliness, yes. Yeah, the future of dastardliness. And I loved your example of, I mean, you had a lot of examples, but you know, and say we brought Neanderthals back. If he, mm -hmm. we, we, did, did, did somebody should sort of stop and go, what would that be like for the Neanderthals? You know, right, yes. it'd be really cool if you could do that. It'd be quite a, a coup and a feather in your cap and what an amazing thing at, for the scientist, but kind of a drag for the, <laughs> the first Neanderthals. Neanderthals yeah. um, and, and just thinking about the future um, and how do, we, how do we get people, you talked about sort of a pre-mortem, like if you could get if you could, I mean, personally, I think every scientist should just read the ice pick surgeon. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, um, it should we teach? Should it be taught in in medical school and in in science curricula? I mean, uh, how do you how do you prevent future um, lapses in judgment and ethics? Yeah, it's a tough question. There's no. Uh 
simple answer to it. And I think that, you know, if someone is either sadistic um, in some cases, or if they're just determined to lie, do something like that, maybe there's not a way to prevent the absolute worst cases from happening. But as we were talking about, most people do go into these kind of situations with good intentions. And I think that had they had someone been able to intervene or stop them, I think there are ways that we could have stopped some what ended up being kind of horrible abuses. And in the book, basically I talk about using good science to fight bad science in that there are certain sort of tricks or programs, things that psychologists have noted that tend to lead to bad outcomes. So for instance, one big warning sign is if all the decision makers are very homogenous and they all think exactly alike. With the Guatemala study that we were talking about before, these were essentially all doctors from a certain uh, income class, certain ethnic class, and they're all white. They basically were the ones who ran this program. And psychologists have noted that people, when it's very homogenous like that, and there's not a lot of different thoughts or perspectives, they tend to have very poor decision making. And especially with moral outcomes, they often don't realize that they are straying into dubious territory. So that's one thing is just break up the homogeneity, get some different viewpoints. Uh, another thing that's important, you mentioned briefly pre-mortems, which kind of sounds like an odd term, but it's kind of the opposite of a post-mortem. And Daniel Conahan in Thinking Fast and Slow, he's drawing on some other psychologist's work, but he mentions this as a good way to sort of interrupt people and get them to think about alternative outcomes. So basically a pre-mortem, what you do is you bring all the people together who are making decisions and you ask them to go through and write out a vivid narrative of what exactly could go wrong and how this could turn into a debacle in the future. And it's really important not just to kind of have this informal kind of that fast brain, uh, brainstorming session where you just kind of toss some ideas out. You got to think it through and you got to write it out as a story hmm. because stories are very powerful things for the human mind. If we get a story that's really gripping and it gets at us in a way that kind of some, you know, uh, isolated brainstorming objectives cannot. And uh, postmortems are a really good way to kind of break people. I mean, people get overconfident, they get overenthusiastic. It's a good way to break that and recognize problems before they get started. So I talk about those and other measures where psychologists have sat down, looked at these things, and they don't have to be too onerous either. They can be a fairly short um, uh, thing to implement. You just have to do it at the right time and to make sure that you do actually do it. Um, Sam, I have the sense that there must have been a lot of stories on the cutting room floor from this book, and I don't want you to you know, give away any more of the book, but I wondered if you had a, um, a story that almost made the cut that you would might want to share with people or, or, um, or whether, I mean, I don't know, I, I, with my book, sometimes I struggle to find enough to, to fill the book, but um, <laughs> I wondered if, were you just overwhelmed with dastardly deeds perpetrated in the name of science? Yeah, I mean, there were tons of scientists out there who have committed crimes, um, you know, who, who just did bad things. But when, when I kind of narrowed it down to the focus on them using um, or pursuing knowledge and committing crimes in the name of that, that kind of did help shape the book. But there were other cases that, uh, one case, for instance, I didn't include because I included it in an earlier book. It was in my book, The Violinist Thumb. It was the, the Soviet scientist, essentially, who uh, he got so interested in uh, human evolution uh, and whether humans had come from an ape-like ancestor. Oh, that he Ivanov, right? Ivanov, yes, he decided to breed humans and orangutans and then and, and see what happened. So I'd kind of already covered that one. Yeah, and there were signs. <laughs> What's that? That was a doozy. That was, he got kind of alarmingly far in these experiments before even, yeah. even the people in the Soviet Union were like, whoa, 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 like do not keep going with these. Yeah. Um, and there were some experiments that I came across about uh, radiation exposure. I mentioned one of them briefly in the excerpt, but there were other cases I probably could have brought out there where they did more of that. But my last book was kind of about atomic science, um, atomic bombs thing. So I just decided to go a bit a different direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wondered, uh, it, sometimes it seems almost as though science itself and the competitiveness and the pressure 
is to blame in some of these. I'm thinking of the the woman toward the end of the book, the forensic, the woman who did the drug. Uh huh. Yep. Annie Dugan. Yeah, yeah. That was. Uh, I mean, I got the sense that she wasn't, you know, pure evil like some of you know some of the other people we spoke about, but just like her, she was so driven. Yeah. Uh, flattered by the you know the positive feedback she was getting for. Well, I, I mean, you should tell this yeah. a little bit, but but I wonder if you had that sense of the just the the competitiveness and pressure of science sometimes causes people to veer off yeah i think i mean science you can you can make a name for yourself people will think you're brilliant you can win awards you can yeah. win praise and promotion by doing better science and i do think that that does drive people uh, the story you were talking about with Annie Dukin, she was a uh, forensic scientist a, working at a drug lab in Massachusetts. And there was a lot of pressure on them because of draconian drug laws to get through as many samples as possible. She swept into this lab and started doing thousands upon thousands of these tests in order to uh, essentially get these cases through the court system. And other scientists in her lab started realizing slowly but surely that she was faking her results. She was doing what they called dry labbing, which means you don't actually run any tests. You just sort of wave your hands and then write something down quick. And that's your analysis. Um, but she, went, she did tens of thousands of samples in this way and was finally exposed after years and years of doing this and through the entire court system of Massachusetts into absolute chaos. I mean, it was just a complete disaster. And it's, I, I mean, you're exactly right. She was driven by the glory, the praise that she was getting. Yeah. Attorneys would call her up. They would, people would refer to her as the superwoman of the lab. And she just loved the attention and thrived on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, you know, reading the book, it, you know, in some of these cases, you, you just, you kind of can't believe that they got away with it, you know, that, um, but it, it, I think, I guess part of it is that there was just this sense, um, even, you know, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, until quite recently, that scientists were good guys. And mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, the pendulum has swung the other way in terms of people's distrust of science now. And I wonder which is worse in a way, you know, giving <laughs> trust to i mean i think of my mother-in-law is like anything her doctor says he's like oh you don't you don't ask questions he's a doctor yeah and now just the sense of like i don't believe in western medicine you know i'm only you know i i mean it's just gone so far and i don't like either extreme i don't know yeah. what question i'm asking you <laughs> it yeah it is tough and it's it's tough to write a book like this at a time when a lot of people are questioning science yeah. and actively mistrusting it but I do think that an honest reckoning with science's past is important. And, you know, I do emphasize in this book and throughout my other books, especially that I, science has done a lot more good than harm in the world. And not just, you know, for the physical things, uh, eliminating diseases stuff. I really think science has opened up a lot of new spiritual uh, realms in that we really understand the universe in a much more profound, interesting way thanks yeah. to science, it really does that. But, you know, there have been rogue individuals, there have been rogue cases. And I think an honest reckoning is important if we want to improve science and move it forward in the future. Yeah, yeah, and I think you chose well, they're, they're complicated characters who yeah. are, for the most part, you know, gradually kind of fall, falling off the right path and, and you know, they've, they've done good. And I mean, they're, they're, in, they're really interesting to think yeah. about and it's a fast it's really a fascinating book i really i really enjoyed it and well, thank uh, you. yeah um and um i think we're uh we're at 45 minutes and so i think we're there's Devin. i think we're in question the, time question time all right yeah thank you guys um yeah so for <laughs> the audience here uh if you have a question to ask um look for that little speech bubble uh question answer box go ahead and drop it in there and uh, we'll, we'll get it in. Uh, so first question comes from Tina Hutchinson, uh, who asks, isn't it also true that most of these guys worked alone? They didn't, need, uh, didn't see a need for collaboration or oversight. Huh. Well, I think it's a bit of a 
a mixed bag in that, yeah, there were definitely uh, several of them who did work alone. I do think that was a bit more common in science in general back then. Nowadays, science is very collaborative. There are very few papers out there with just a single author or a project being done by a single person. Whereas back then, I think it was a little bit more common. But in some cases, as I, you know, John Cutler, the uh, doctor in Guatemala, he was writing letters back and forth to people in Washington all the time. And in fact, they briefed the Surgeon General about this case at one point. And according to one witness, the Surgeon General sort of laughed. And I think they, someone said he had a little merry twinkle in his eye and said, you know, we couldn't do that experiment in the United States. Good thing it's going on down there. So you, even in the cases when they had oversight, you do see these cases where they were kind of getting away with it. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, question from Kathy. Have you been contemplating gene editing outcomes? I did talk about that a little bit. I guess we kind of got away from, Mary brought it up, the appendix where it talks about the future of crime. And I do talk about gene editing in there as one of three areas where I think we could see some interesting developments in the future. I talk about advanced computing power, uh, genetic engineering, and space travel in that uh, going to other planets, things like that, might introduce some sort of novel or new crimes, uh, different crimes than we might experience on Earth. So that's kind of the the uh, range of future topics I talk about. But yeah, genetic engineering was definitely one of them that I talk about kind of in the future. But we've already seen uh, there was a scientist in China who went rogue and he edited some uh, embryos there. And there were two small girls born. And again, a classic case where he was trying to do something good. Uh, their father was HIV positive. And he was trying to prevent the daughters from getting uh, HIV, since there are certain mutations that leave you immune to HIV. But he went in with basically no oversight. It's a good example of a case with very little oversight. Went in, edited the embryos, did a sloppy job of it, in fact, and then just went ahead to see what would happen. And he's now, I believe, in jail for doing that work without oversight. So even, you know, I, I, put, I talked about it as being in the future, but these things are kind of creeping up on us now even. Um, next question, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce this name, but Ewan asks, uh, who's the most interesting character you met during your research? Um, a couple of them do stand out. I think Will uh, uh, Friedman, uh, the, the lobotomist doctor I mentioned, he was, I mean, just first of all, the work he did and just how, again, how fascinating it was in kind of this macabre way. But also he was a big, colorful personality. He was a real showman, despite all of the horrible things that he was doing. So he was, just, he was just someone you couldn't take your eye off of in a uh, kind of an unsettling way. So I still think about Walter Freeman sometimes and just what a, what a creepy but fascinating person he was. So he's someone who, who stands out. Um, another case in the book that stands out is the, the first chapter. He's the pirate, William Dampier, who was an English buccaneer who sort of like the, uh, the Henry Smithman, the slave uh, naturalist we talked about, was someone who loved natural science, wanted to get to different points around the world. But in that time, in the 1600s, the only way you could do that essentially was to become a pirate. So he joined a pirate crew, started sailing around the world, raiding and plundering, essentially to fuel his addiction to natural history. And it just seems like such a strange choice to be that obsessed with science that you would become a pirate, but that was the life he chose. <laughs> wow. We should get more, uh, some contemporaneous pirate scientists out there. A <laughs> uh, question from Zach. Uh, hello from Australia. When researching an historical figure, do you ever come across one great source to answer your questions or is it always collecting little bits from many sources? 
It's almost always collecting little bits from lots of sources. Uh, you know, sometimes there's just one great source that comes up and you just think, wow, this, this has pretty much everything I want. But in a lot more cases, it's piecing it together from lots of different places. And I think that's good, not only to kind of uh, cross check and fact check, but you get a little different perspective. Uh, you know, sometimes the most detailed rich sources might be the person's friend. So they might have a lot of great anecdotes, but it's going to be shaded in a certain way. They're going to defend them. You could then get a critic to kind of put things in a different perspective. So I like kind of the piecing together. And Mary, you could probably uh, speak to this as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's always bits and pieces. But you are so good at, at taking all of those and, and creating this really kind of flowing narrative that doesn't ever... You, you have no idea that, I mean, if you look at the back, you can see all the sources, but it never reads that way. It's always just so, the narrative is so well paced. You're such a good storyteller. Oh, th I mean, it's, it's <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because a lot of the times you're thinking this is never going to hold together. Oh, and that's totally what, does. Oh, well, that's what the footnotes are for as well. That's the stuff I can't bear to cut, but it's interrupting. No, I hear you there. <laughs> yeah, I dump it down, yeah. All right, uh, question from Hannah here. Uh, what was your inspiration for this specific topic and set of stories? Um, a couple of things. I had been kind of collecting string in that I had been interested in scientists who did uh, bad things for a while. So I kind of had this idea percolating and just collecting stories here and there. And also I, I like uh, true crime stuff. I like mysteries. I enjoy things like that. There's kind of an illicit thrill in some ways. I think it's just fascinating for people. And the idea of looking at something that I've always been interested in, science and kind of combining the two was just something I wanted to try and something I figured, you know, I, I thought now was kind of the time for, to, for me to give that a shot. Uh question I had here, actually, um, you mentioned that one of the kind of red flags that, that comes up when people are starting to get into the tunnel vision it is um, like the optimism uh, involved in it. And I'm wondering uh, if you've had any thoughts about the way that um, sort of like uh, modern the way that modern business intersects with science, uh, I was thinking specifically about like the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. but or Theranos. Uh, this research is, or this uh, money dynamic is, is playing out more. And I'm, I'm wondering if like the, the kind of optimism that you get from, from like tech founders, now that it's sort of getting into biomedical fields could be like kind of an issue with that uh, over optimism. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, when it was tech stuff and just, you know, computing and things like that, that didn't really intersect with people's health and their daily lives. So, you know, if people went bust in that, it didn't really harm anyone except the people taking the risk. Nowadays, you're right in that it is moving, we're getting sort of this melding of the tech world, biomedicine, and you saw that uh, notoriously with the Elizabeth Holmes, the Theranos case that was out in, in the Bay Area, where it wasn't working and they just thought they would keep bluffing their way through it essentially to see if they see if it would work. And so those incentives uh, can be perverse. And I think you're right that the optimism does play into it sometimes because people think, you know, either I'm a genius, I'm going to figure this out, or, you know, we'll just figure it out as we go and throw it together. And you do see cases in science history where long shots, where it works out. So sometimes people do get lucky. But as you said, when it starts to intersect with people's health and you know interactions with doctor, biomedicine, things like that, that's where it gets ethically dubious. Yeah, it's interesting. There didn't seem to be many cases in here where the, where it was you you would blame greed, money, you know, money and the desire. Whereas now I feel like the pressure particularly mentioning pharma pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. but the, the amount of money to be made if it takes off. I mean, I didn't, yeah. I didn't, it didn't come through in, in the um, stories here that, that greed was a primary motivator. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The incentives are changing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so last question here. Let's say you are a scientist. You've got a good idea. Uh, it's going <laughs> pretty well, but then you start to realize that you're on the cusp of crossing a line or maybe you've 
tiptoed over it a little bit. Okay. Uh, what do you do to sort of, uh, what, what's the procedure for like not going all the way down the tunnel? Okay. Well, I would say that at the point where you're realizing there might be a bit of an ethical issue, that's probably a very good start. I mean, if your spidey sense is going off there, that, that, that's a good thing. Pay attention to it, first of all. Do not dismiss it. Um, in some ways, the harder part is to just get that thought into their head that there might be an issue. But if you do notice something, um, talk to some people. Bring up your concerns. Don't hide it to yourself. Don't just pretend like it's going to go away. It's probably not going to go away. Um, maybe pause as well. Don't just keep rushing forward. Um, sometimes the projects feel like they have a bit of a momentum and you just have to keep pushing. But I think in the long run, you're probably going to be better off just stopping, talking to someone. Uh, if you're a little younger, maybe seek out someone older uh, who's a little bit more experienced. Um, to read up on some biomedical ethics, something like that. Uh, or just read, you know, Jesus. <laughs> yes, read that. I mean, just read some, I mean, one thing I was trying to do with the book is that I talked about how powerful stories are. And when hopefully with the book, if someone reads it, and they think about those stories, in some cases, there's a real gut punch that you might not get if you're just thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I can't harm anyone, or I don't want to be unethical. When you put it in a story form, and you see how people were hurt and things like that, it sticks with you in a way. So, that, I mean, hopefully that is something someone could get out of the book is the understanding or like the deeper understanding and it, hopefully it'll kind of stick with you. Oh, right on. Well, thank you so much for being here, both of you, Sam Keen, Mary Roach. Uh, this has been truly excellent. <laughs> I've learned a lot about biomedical ethics. Um, so that's, that's it for tonight. Uh, if you would like to buy this book through our website, of course you can. Uh, just greenapplebooks.com. Um, if you're interested in seeing what events we've got coming up, it's just greenapplebooks.com slash events, and you'll get to the calendar from there. Um, that's it for the night. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, everyone. Great to see you, Sam, and I'll see you in the fall. Okay, bye. Okay.